In today's episode, we're going to go over diastatic power. What is it and how does understanding it benefit us? This is Still in the Clear, the podcast that distills the art and science of home distilling into easy-to-follow, audible nuggets for the beginning moonshiner. This information is for education and entertainment purposes only. You could even call it fiction if you want to. Home distilling may be illegal in your area. I'm your host, Cyrus, and I'm just a guy that lives in the woods and likes to make shine. So let's get into it. Hey, if any of you have specific ideas for show topics you'd like me to cover, I'd love to hear them. There are a number of ways you can contact me. You can leave me a comment at stillintheclear.com. You can email me at stillintheclear at gmail.com. Or you can drop a comment on any of our videos at our YouTube channel, Still in the Clear. Or, most effectively, you can come chat with me and the other home distillers in the Moonshine for Beginners group at mewe.com. When I'm just hanging out online, that's where I spend most of my time. So come on and join us. I'll leave links for all of these ways to contact me in the show notes and the description so it's easy for you to find. Now, let's get on with the show. So I need to make a correction from last week's episode. Last week we talked about uh, a recipe using cultured enzymes. And part of that recipe called for some inverted sugar to kind of kickstart Uh, the fermentation process. And in that episode, I said to use two gallons of inverted sugar, which was a mistake. I had meant to say two pounds inverted sugar. And that's a big difference because uh, two pounds of sugar inverted will make just about one third of a gallon. So if you use one gallon of inverted sugar, you're using about three times the amount that's necessary for that recipe. So just need to make that correction. uh, And I'm sorry about that. Somebody pointed that out to me in a comment and I'm glad they did because I didn't even realize I had made that mistake, Um, which brings me to encourage any of you to, to correct me on any of my mistakes and in fact disagree with me if I say something that maybe you think isn't right or is said a better way, go ahead and leave me a comment um, because I certainly don't want to misspeak. I want to correct anything I say that I said incorrectly and I also want to correct my thinking and my knowledge if I'm actually saying something that's wrong. So feel free to comment uh, even when you disagree with me. Now, let's get going with today's topic. So, understanding diastatic power is the first step in using the all-grain recipe. The all-grain recipe, also known as a grain bill, is a mash that uses only the enzymes present in the grains to convert the starch in the grains into fermentable sugar. So, you're not adding any sugar to the mash, nor are you adding any cultured enzymes like we did last week? An all grain mash uh, will contain a malted grain with a high di- diastatic power, along with other grains uh, that are referred to as adjuncts usually that contain high starches to can be to be converted uh, into fermentable sugars by the enzymes that are present in the malted grain. You know, last week we took a step toward the all-grain mash and away from the sugar wash by introducing cultured enzymes into a grain mash to make use of the starch present in the grains. And this week we're going to talk about diastatic power in malted grains to prepare us for an all-grain mash recipe next week. So all-grain recipes are usually they're more finicky and can be more expensive depending on how you're doing than a simple you know sugar mash or just a mash that we add cultured enzymes to so 
Why bother with them, you may ask, right? Well, it is the more traditional approach. And if you're one for tradition, this can add a lot more satisfaction to your home distilling hobby. Um, many say that the final product tastes better. This is sometimes true and sometimes not true because taste is subjective. And as a home distiller, you only have to please your taste. Um, and I think everyone should try an all grain recipe to find out for themselves if, if they like the taste better or um, if they just prefer the satisfaction of the traditional process. And when you're doing all grain recipes, there's a lot of different ways to affect flavor. Um, and remember, experimentation is part of the excitement of home distilling. So what is diastatic power? We're going to get snackered, I tell you what, boy, man. I want to get all messed up and it just blew our mind. It's a three sheets of dang old wind, man. Diastatic power measures a malted grain's enzymatic content. The United States unit of measure is degree linter. This measurement is given to one pound of malt or malted grain and is a representation of the amount of enzymes present in the malted grain. I've found malted grains with a diastatic power with a degree linter as low as 20 and as high as 180 linter. And it's commonly accept, it's a commonly accepted standard that a malted grain needs a diastatic power measurement of at least 35 to convert all of its own starch. So with the knowledge of diastatic power, we can begin to create our own recipes and have a basic expectation of how much starch conversion we can possibly achieve with that recipe. It also gives us a better understanding if we're just copying a recipe that someone else has given us or that we have found online. If we understand the diastatic power, then we have a better understanding of how that recipe is working, what we can expect from it, and, uh, and you know, what kind of ABV we might be able to expect, things like that. Now, your actual percentage of starch conversion with a given recipe can also be affected by other variables in the mash process and other things, but we'll cross those bridges later on. Today, we're just talking about the diastatic power and the expectations that we can gain from it. And the, the calculation for figuring out the diastatic power of a grain bill is pretty simple. You take the diastatic power of the malted grain times the pounds of that grain used and divided by the total pounds of all the grains in the grain bill. So for an example, if you're using a two row malt with a degree linter of 140 and you're using one and a half pounds, you multiply 140 times one and a half and you have 200 and 10 degree linter of diastatic power in the portion, in that portion of the grain bill, meaning just within that grain alone. But you'll also have adjuncts uh, like corn. Let's say you use uh, one and a half pounds of cornmeal. Now you divide the 210 by the total pounds, which is now three. And this gives you a final degree linter of 70. And a grain bill with 70 degree linter has enough enzymatic power to potentially convert all the starches in the recipe during a one hour mash time. Uh, and that's a pretty commonly held standard of that 70 number uh, should give you 100% conversion with a one hour mash time. Again, there are other variables that will affect the actual conversion. Anything lower than 70 is less likely to convert all the starch that's present. And this is not to say that you should always go for 100% conversion. Because remember, different malted grains have their own flavors and can affect the final product. Um, you may have a preference as to what percentage of ABV you like to work with. Um, and this is one of the reasons why there are just thousands of recipes. 
It's all about experimentation and finding what you like best. And that is not always 100% conversion and high yield ABV around 20%. There uh, are lots of great flavors without 100% conversion and low ABV. So if you're wanting to expand your skills into trying all grain mashes, you need to have an understanding of diastatic power and it's not that tough. Uh, I just gave you the basics of it and there's not a whole lot more to it than that. When you, when you purchase malted grains, in the description of what you're purchasing, they will list a diastatic power, uh, a degree linter rating so that you'll know ahead of time what you, what you can expect. It gets a little bit more tricky when you are malting your own grains, figuring out the diastatic power, um, with malted grains at home is tougher. So, but this, but this understanding of diastatic power just gets us one step closer to the all grain mash. If that's something you're interested in doing. So next week, we're going to go over an all grain recipe that we can try. So I hope this information was helpful and I'll talk to you guys next week. Well, that wraps up this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Share this episode with people you think might enjoy it. That would be much appreciated. It'll sure help our show grow. And don't forget, doing is improving. Have a good one. Talk to y'all next week.